So afternoon, morning, uh, wherever you are, and big welcome to all of you, and thanks for joining this Chamber's Talent webinar today. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know me, but for those of you who may not, I'm Kate Evans. I'm the Head of Associate and the Student Guides here at Chambers. Um, I'm also joined today by Lisa Hart Shepherd and David Johnson, uh, Rory Dadswell and Lucia Cinder, and we're all really excited to chat about the launch of research for our talent products with you today show you some of the latest developments over the last year and also explain how our research will be used this year and how your firms can benefit from that. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to start with some highlights from the last year of our associate research. So last year we covered 94 firms in across the US top 200. Um, our researchers spoke to around 700 second and third year associates. Um, our researchers also interviewed 76 managing partners. So that's one of the highest numbers that we've seen in the research cycle in memory, actually. So on behalf of myself and my team, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our associate clients for their continued dedication and support to our research each year. Um, on top of this, we've continued to grow our career moves platform, um, partnering with recruiters to produce articles targeted to associates looking to lateral. Um, and as many of you are aware from the last year, one of the big changes that we made was to our annual survey. So on the next slide here, you can, I'll give you some context to this. So this graph shows you how the associate survey has developed over the years. Um, you can see here that the survey started out almost as a trial run really back in 2015. And then as we slowly added more associate classes over time, we further re refined the question sets too. Um, and then this takes us all the way up to last year when we launched the survey under Chambers Talent Research. The reason being is now we all use one single survey here at Chambers to form the basis of three main Chambers Talent products. So that is associate, student, and our leading teams. So you may be wondering what is Chambers Talent all about and what is leading teams? Um, this slide here shows you how all of these three products sit under the Chambers Talent umbrella. So for clarity, you can see here that um, associate on associate, we still use data in exactly the same way as we have in years prior. No changes have been made to the research processes. Um, and the same goes for the UK edition of associate, which is called Chamber Student. Both guides offer an objective analysis of law firms across um, the markets, and we gather information in two main ways. So firstly is our in-depth telephone research, as many of you will probably be familiar with. So that's where we speak to current associates to get the inside view of what life is like at the firm. We then also, combined with that, send out our annual survey each year, and that complements that telephone research. So on the back of this survey, uh, we have collected over nine years of data, which includes around 30,000 responses and over 2.5 million data points. And a result of this means that we can now offer firms a new talent product on the back of this rich data set, which is called Leading Teams. In a nutshell, Leading Teams takes unpublished data from that annual survey to offer firms an in-depth analysis to inform their talent strategies. It also allows firms to understand the root cause of engagement and retention issues at the firm, and it helps them benchmark their performance with comparable practices and departments. But I will now hand you over to David, who will share with you the deeper insight into the talent market we're now able to offer from this survey um, and also how this all filters into the leading team's product. Fabulous, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, and lovely to meet you all for the first time. Um, my name is David Johnson. I'm a director of client services on the leading team's product. I just want to spend a couple of moments just sharing with you, I guess, kind of the extent to the depth which we can now kind of help and support firms in a really strategic way because of the support that you've given to uh, the survey so far. Many of you will be um, aware of the ways in which the survey kind of helps inform the employer brand uh, work that you do, but we are also collecting a huge amount of insight now that we're working with firms to help them understand, I guess, kind of more strategic questions across kind of their offerings. So just to give you kind of a, an overview, I guess, of some of the things that we're able to kind of work with firms now and kind of give them insights on, um, in that kind of culture space, we've been able to use the insights to work with kind of law firm leaders to understand what is our firm culture? What does it stand for? What is it that kind of makes it special? How is that kind of different to some of our peers within the market? What are the things that really kind of drive our culture? And, and what are the things that, you know, could potentially be damaging to it? There's also kind of a lot of questions in there that we've been using to support um, colleagues in learning and development roles, uh, you know, particularly on the career path uh, that associates 
have and see in front of them within firms. So how do they feel about their prospects? Kind of what do they, what support do they need? What's working within their firms? Where do they see their gaps? We're hope we're hoping kind of seeing through this new product that we're able to kind of help firms really kind of strategically get under the bonnet of some of these questions and work out this, the core differences between your firm, firm and some of the competitors in the market. Yes, because some of the range of questions we've got in the survey as well, because we're looking at, you know, things like work allocation, remote work policies, we've been able to look over the course of the last 12 months to try and work out what are some of the kind of levers of high performance that firms can start to pull. So what, what are the impact of different remote working policies on motivation, engagement, retention? How does work allocation impact culture? You know, what are the things that firms can be doing to try and drive more, I guess, effectiveness from some of their associates based on operational needs? So we've been using some of that data to help firms um, kind of practice managers and those with, a, I guess, a policy remit within their roles help kind of um, inform the way that the firm is being kind of run. Uh, and then finally, in that question, as, you know, we've got a lot of recruitment professionals on the call today. So what we wanted to do today was just kind of, I guess, kind of dig into the element of the survey, which kind of really unpacks employer brand. So what is it that drives people to particular firms? What is it that makes different firms propositions in the market unique and different? How does it differ to peers? How authentic are firm propositions and how well do you know the promise that has been made at recruitment kind of line up with the reality? So this is um, what we wanted to kind of, I guess, share back with you some of the learnings that we found in this space over the course of the last 12 months in terms of trends in um, attracting uh, new associates into the firm, laterals, and how all of that matches to the experience that they've been telling us through the survey. So, I'm going to introduce now uh, my colleague, uh, Lisa Hart Shepherd, who's going to kind of take us through some of the insights that we've been kind of finding in this space around you know, what is it that drives uh, different types of individuals to different types of firms. Thank you, David. Yeah, so I'm Lisa. I'm the Chief Data Innovation Officer here at Chambers. And the first analysis that we wanted to share with you was the reason why new associates decided to join the firm that they selected. And we've honed in on those people that started as summer associates because we wanted to look at people that had some experience of working with the firms over those summers and they're joining, so they're joining on the basis of what the lived experience is like. So we can look at the first data slide, please. So this is the reasons why summer associates said they chose to join the firm that they ended up at. Altogether, there was 37 different reasons. So we saw a real broad base of opinion coming through here. But the biggest reason overall was that they liked the people that they had met when they worked at the firm, closely followed by how they find the culture and that, that fit for themselves. After that came more sort of technical work-related factors, including the specific practice group strength, the quality of the work opportunities, and the firm's reputation. So bearing in mind that most people mentioned associates, that's a prerequisite. They have to find, find affinity with those people that they met. But after that, they tended to give two or three additional reasons. And when we looked at the spread of that data, we saw that the reasons grouped together to create what we're calling different employer brand dimensions. So for the next couple of slides, we're going to take a look at some of those. Now, there was three main dimensions that came up the most often. The first was around the firm's reputation, that practice strength and location came into. So that's sort of practical, tangible factors that the firms offered. The second was much more intangible. This was a group that really felt they had that cultural fit and they also felt that they would do well there. They saw that opportunity for partnership. And then the third group was different again. They were more about the rewards, so be that the money, the prestige, and again, the location coming through. Now, interestingly, we looked at all these people once they joined the firms, how happy were they in general? And we found that the, the money people were actually the least happy overall, and they were the most likely to want to leave the firms, often looking to seek more work-life balance. In this next slide, we're gonna look at the other sort of significant dimensions that we uncovered. And these are definitely the most significant in terms of volume of associates they represented. 
So the first pro profile is those that were looking for the best training and mentoring, looking to get that career development. The second contingent is drawn to the global reach. So looking at the growth trajectory of that firm. The third contingent was focused on diversity and pro bono, so quite different from the others, looking at the pro bono opportunities that they would get. After that came work-life balance and working patterns. The next group was the compensation system, the work allocation system. So they're really looking to say, what's the systemic way this firm approaches, how they give out work and how they reward people. And then finally, those that were looking for the best firm in a particular location. And often these firms would also be focused on a particular industry group. So very different profile again. Now you might think, why are those two in green? Well, that's because we found that those two groups were actually the most happy with their firm choices. There was quite a clear, tangible qualities that they were looking for and they felt that they had been delivered when they actually went to then work at the firm. So there were some other different aspects about the profiles of the different people that, that chose the different dimensions. And here we're looking at the gender split and we did see different demographic profiles for most of the different dimensions. So there was one group that was quite extreme on the male side, um, and that was the money prestige location group. And then on the female side, twice as likely for these two profiles to be women, and that was the diversity and pro bono group, and then also the work-life balance and working patterns group. Next, we wanted to look at how these dimensions broke down for each individual firm. And it's worth noting that we can only do this for firms when we get enough sort of volume of responses. It's got to be a robust base to be able to break it down across all of those different dimensions. Hint there to, to push up the survey numbers. Um, but there was three firms in particular that were highly differentiated, but probably around a third of the firms showed quite strong differentiated employer brands. So the three examples we've pulled out here, we can't tell you who, because obviously this is data that's confidential to each firm. But firm A, we found that 43% of their associates were choosing that firm for that systemic approach. So how they rewarded and how they allocated work and the variety of work that that gave them. And that was versus just 9% of the average firm. So you can see how much of a spike that is on, on that particular dimension. Firm B had 27% of their associates choosing that firm for its diverse leadership, the pro bono programs they offered versus just 7% for the average firm. And there wasn't very many firms that sort of spiked on this particular um, dimension. And then the third firm, which was the most differentiated of all, there was 46% of their associates choosing that firm for its global footprint and the sort of growth trajectory that firm they felt had shown or, or offered them. This is just 4% for the average firm. So you can see that's a really strong spike for that particular firm. Now, it's course, of course, it's worth bearing in mind that with any employer brand proposition, the, the proof of the pudding is when they join that firm, does the firm live up to what it promises? Does the reality match the promise? So I'm now going to pass to David Johnson, who's going to talk a little bit more about the data we found on the experience of working at firms and how much firms are delivering on those promises. Over to you, David. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so yeah, so what I want to do now is kind of try and explore the relationship between expectations of kind of what life will be like at a firm and then the reality once people have landed. So Lisa's just taken us through some of the different motivations, I guess, and the personas that drive certain people towards certain types of firms. But what happens when they land? Like what matters then? And, and how are firms starting to kind of perform against those areas? So to try and understand a little bit more about what it is that drives people kind of when they're in the firm, um, we looked at all of the different metrics on life at the firm that we've been able to track in the survey. So we've got around 50 different uh, in total now, covering satisfaction from salary to learning and development provision, remote working policies, team communication, AI strategy, everything that we you could possibly think of that may have an influence on kind of the experience of life at a firm. 
So we looked at all of these and we carried out some analysis analysis to uh, understand which ones actually matter the most when it comes to creating a positive experience where people want to try. So what we're looking at now are the results of some correlation analysis that we ran to try and understand which aspects at the life of the firm impact happiness the most. What you can see in the top left are the drivers that had the strongest relationship with how engaged people were on that day to day. And at the bottom, uh, the drivers had, had the weakest relationship. We've just showed the top and bottom to give you a kind of sense of the difference and the rest of the measures kind of sat somewhere else in between. Um, there's some really interesting stuff coming out of all of this. I think the first is when we did this analysis, we found that some of the reward elements that you can kind of see at the bottom around bonus, around salary, actually had the lowest impact on happiness of all the things that they were measuring. Now, I'm not saying they're not important. I'm not saying they're an absolutely crucial part of the attraction factor. But I think what the analysis is telling us is that once you are in the firm, throwing more money at people doesn't necessarily improve their happiness and engagement um, on the day to day anywhere as much as we might think. Similarly, also quite surprising on the remote working policy, when we ran the statistical analysis, we found that this was something people were quite vocal about, but didn't really have as strong as a relationship of actually how happy they are than we might have thought. Um, the areas that came through as kind of the real drivers of engagement, the things the firms kind of had to get right, otherwise they were kind of really at risk of kind of losing their people were those that you can see at the top. So this kind of feeling that you're being invested in and nurtured by partners, is that kind of camaraderie amongst kind of you and your fellow associates, is there a culture of support that kind of runs through your team and are there kind of opportunities to develop your technical skill and your kind of legal practical knowledge? And then the final one, the kind of of this list, I think is really important. And this was a sense that they came through. People really wanted a sense that the career at the firm that they had chosen was compatible with their ambitions for kind of how they wanted to live their life. And I think this is quite a personal one. And it links to those personas and those motivations that Leif had just talked to. Now, for some, this was about, look, does this firm provide a platform where I can do incredible highly technical work for prestigious clients and, you know, take all of the sort of the trappings, positive and negative come with that. And for some, it was more, look, does this firm offer a culture that might be a bit more, I'll put it, sympathetic or compatible to a more rounded lifestyle? Different people kind of meant different things when they were kind of looking at this, answering this question, and it depended upon their ambitions and I guess in part why they joined the firm. But apart from that, the other interesting thing is um, these five drivers of engagement were the same for all of the personas that Lisa talked about at the beginning. So while people are attracted to and kind of making joining decisions about joining different firms on different criteria and different motivations, when they land, it's these five areas that matter the most. And that was consistent across everybody that we looked at within the market. So we then want to understand, OK, if these are the things that matter, how are firms doing? Um, so what you can see now, these lighter blue bars show the average level of satisfaction in the US associate market with each of these aspects of life of the firm. And these are average scores on a scale of one to seven, where seven is extremely happy. So the closer to seven, broadly speaking, the kind of the happier the market is, I guess, uh, on each of these aspects. And I think what's quite interesting is that on most of the important indicators, people are actually quite engaged and happy, you know, particularly around that ability to help people develop their career. The platform, you know, is absolutely there. The opportunity is absolutely there. But also, you know, by and large, there's a high degree of agreement. There's cultural support within teams. And to a high, but slightly less extent, the extent to which people feel they're kind of being invested in by their partners. I think also just worth noticing the happiness levels with salary uh, at the bottom there. So this is quite interesting, highest level of satisfaction of almost any of the metrics in the market, but the lowest impact on actually how happy it makes people overall. So I think quite an interesting one. Um, to just kind of bear in mind. Something that we did think was really interesting was um, uh, this area of high importance and low satisfaction dynamic. And this is all around that kind of reality of life and how that is meeting associates' expectations and desires for what they want to achieve and how they want to live. 
And I think this is why understanding the motivations of why people pick your firm is absolutely key. For how closely do the expectations align to what you as a firm can honestly offer them as a career is so important to how authentically you can sell the firm uh, and their subsequent experience. How authentic is that employee value proposition? Have people chosen your firm for the right reasons based on what you can genuinely offer and are you able to deliver them? I think this is the real battleground motivated high performers in the US market at the moment. And what we're seeing is that firms are having a really kind of mixed set of results when it comes to delivering on that. We've just looked at averages, but when we look at this on a firm by firm basis, it gives us a completely different picture. If we move on to the next slide, this chart shows of satisfaction of associates across 90 different firms in the market. Now the numbers represent the average happiness score on a scale of one to seven. So same, same as last slide, the closer to seven, the, the more happy your people on average across your associates are. And you can just see from this, the spread from happy to kind of somewhere to, around kind of the average of four, which is, which is quite low. The experience is not necessarily universal across the market. Different firms are kind of having um, a different scenario, I guess, kind of play out in this space. So understanding kind of where you sit on the spectrum and what it is that's either kind of pushing you up towards the top or pulling you down is going to be absolutely crucial to understanding, I guess, how authentically you can kind of sell that experience in the market. So over the course of the last six months or so on the Leading Teens project, that's what we've been trying to do. We've been working with firms to kind of really get under the bonnet of some of this stuff and unpack look, what is that, you know, where's your position on this chart and, and how you kind of compare, not just to the market at large, but to a specific peer group that you kind of see as a similar type of firm to you. And I wish I could sit here today and say, you know, after working with all of these firms, we've discovered this kind of secret magic formula that absolutely everybody can apply. Um, the reality is every firm that we've worked with so far has been completely different and had their own unique culture, their offering policy, set of things that, you know, that kind of make that firm special and on occasion sometimes kind of create challenges. Um, we've been kind of unpacking with firms how they differentiate positively and negatively through their leadership messaging, their culture, their lateral promise, their ability to you know, adapt their offering across the lifestyle of an associate as they kind of move into parenthood or move into kind of a different kind of stage of their career, extent which they can create predictability in people's lives and the consistency which we, they can offer all of that across their different practices and offices. All of these variables are being playing out different, different ways with different firms and kind of building their unique story about what their employer value proposition has been. Um, if there was one you know, one kind of unifying theme or one unique takeaway I could kind of give the group uh, to take away from this is the firms that have had the highest levels of engagement. So we think back to that last slide, those at the top end. I think the thing that kind of ran through all of those firms were they were the firms that had the smallest gap between their promise to the market and the kind of ultimate lived reality of kind of what life tended to be like at that firm. It's kind of understanding what that lived reality is, how it compares to kind of why people join the firm, how it's being positioned in the market, absolutely crucial to retention, motivation, performance, and the authenticity with which you kind of consistently sell your strengths. So we've got a sense of kind of why people are joining at the beginning of their career, some of the things that are kind of challenging them as they kind of go through that journey, what are they, what's kind of working well, maybe where some of the disconnects, sense that it's playing out differently within different firms. Um, but what we also found is that when people then wanted to make their next move, so they'd had that experience at the firm and they become a lateral um, potential mover, um, things change again. And I'm going to bring Lisa back in to kind of talk through kind of how that changes once people kind of enter the lateral market, I guess. Yeah, thanks, David. So here we're about to look at the same data as we did at the very beginning when we were look at, looking at why summer associates had chosen the firms they did. Here we're looking at associates that have made a lateral move to a different firm and the reasons why then they, they joined their second firm effectively. So exactly the same question. If we can look at the slide, please, thank you. So it's interesting to see that the five top reasons were again the five top reasons with this particular group, but we do see quite a change in the order. So I think you'll remember last time people was very far at the top, followed by culture. Both of those moved down. So people went from 38 to 18 there. 
The three that have moved up are much more focused on the actual legal capabilities and perceptions of the firm. So practice group, the strength, perceived strength of the practice group moving right to the top, the quality of the work opportunity, opportunities and the, the reputation of the firm, the most prominent reasons of why laterals have joined the firm that they did. We also thought we'd isolate all of those associates that said that they might move in the next two years. So they're getting starting to get itchy feet a bit. And we asked them where they were going to go to next. Now, interesting to note that half actually weren't going to go to a law firm at all. They mainly work life balance reasons. They were going, wanting to go in house or work in a government or leave the legal profession altogether. But of the half that did want to join law firms, and um, these were the top five firms that came up. So thinking about the fact that those legal capabilities have moved right up the list, not surprising then we're seeing a firm like Latham have that dominant position at the top, or Wise, Kirkland, Gibson, Scadden. Obviously, the, the, the list goes on and on. So a lot of data to take in there over the last few slides. And what we wanted to do next, we, saw, we sort of finish off our next steps, was to just think about what have we learned from this data and what could be the implications to consider for each of your firms? And as I'm going through these, it's worth bearing in mind, we do have a Q&A on the, on the system. So if you want to post any questions, we've got someone on the team who's going to be looking through those and we'll cover what we can on this session. So if we can just move on to the implications slide, please. Next slide. So what were the main things that, that we learned? We've learned that one size does not fit all. Different associates are making their choices of which firms to join based on different criteria. But we know that the people they meet, certainly for that first role, is the most influential factor. We know that we see different demographic profiles for those different criteria. And we saw that some firms are attracting associates based on a single, singular dimension. So they have very differentiated employer brands. We also learned that some firms aren't living up to the promises that they're making through that employer brand. And then those associates that then choose to make lateral moves are much more focused on legal strengths like the practice capabilities, the reputation, the quality of work. And while still important, people in cult culture don't dominate as much as they did. So as leaders in your firms looking at what this means, um, think really to use this data to think about what does your employer brand stand for? And is it effective? Is it working for you in terms of attracting the right mix of talent? Are you then delivering to people's expectations, to the promise, to the reality? And what might be leading not just to a, a loss of talent, but sometimes a loss of motivation, a lowering of the engagement levels within the firm? really want to just reinforce that having this sort of data and evidence is the first step and then sort of moving your employer value position on to, to where it needs to get to. So with that, I'm going to pass on to Kate, who's going to share the schedule for this year's coming research. Thank you, Lisa. And so to give you a sense of how research timelines will work this year, it'll actually work very similarly to the previous year for us on Associates. So my colleague Amy has already sent the survey out to all existing customers and associates that went live within the last week. Um, the survey launch this year is the first step for Associate 2025 research and for leading teams um, as well. Uh, like last year, we are recommending a survey completion date of the 31st of October. <laughs> this is so we can collect enough, da enough base data for our researchers to use and to help them inform their background research before taking their second and third year associate calls. This year, we are closing the survey by the end of December, and this is because as the survey continues to grow and grow in numbers year on year, we just need to ensure that we have enough time for our team to build out those results for our annual legal market report and for the associate satisfaction results ahead of guide launch. Um, and it also allows the, for those who do take on leading teams to receive delivery of those results as that reporting window starts in January. In terms of the rest of research then, Amy has already began reaching out to some firms to book them in for their research week. Um, Amy is going to try and schedule those firms in for a similar time to when they were scheduled in the years prior. Um, lastly, as usual, you can expect callbacks to begin at a similar time in February of next year. So that's when you'll receive your data forms, get hires, um, the managing partner transcripts for 
to be sent off for the firm to review and for the other, of other information to be completed. Um, and then lastly, we anticipate guide launch to occur in May again of next year. Amy and I are very much looking forward to collaborating with all of you once again this year, and please do reach out to the two of us if you have any questions at all about this year's cycle. I'm now going to hand you over to Rory and Lucia, our commercial leads, to chat about next steps. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, hello everybody. For those that don't know me, my name is Rory Dadswell. I lead the uh, Chambers Talent commercial team. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, David. Thanks, Lisa. Um, just before we jump into the q and I wanted to firstly say that it's going to be business as usual um, from a commercial point of view. So my team will be reaching out to ensure you all have the, the best profile suited to the firm, any additional content that you want to write and confirm the subscription for the Chambers Associate Guide. Um, I will be the main point of contact for leading teams, so the analysis that we've just looked at. Um, so if you are interested in any of the analysis that we've just discussed and how this would, you wanted to understand how this would look um, bespoke to your firm, please do reach out to me. Um, as Kate mentioned at the start, the analysis we offer um, at both a market and a firm level is all driven from the same survey that feeds the associate guide, the student guide, and leading team. So please do this year really strive to drive that engagement. Um, we would suggest a minimum, and that is a minimum of about 30% respondents. Um, and we'll be in touch this year to um, provide any best practices to help you drive that engagement with the survey. Um, for any of those that are on the webinar that aren't currently part of the Chamber of Associate Guide um, and are interested in um, being an option to our audience or um, taking part in the leading teams analysis as well, um, please do get in touch with my colleague, Lucha, who I'll pass over to now. Hi guys, um, lovely to see you all. As I'm, um, I'm pretty sure many of you know, I'm Lucia and I'm the account manager for the Associate Guide and I'll continue to be a point of contact for the Associate Guide, as Rory mentioned. Um, and very shortly, um, I will start popping up in your inboxes um, to, to discuss this year's uh, subscription and, and to make sure that everything that uh, we, we, we do together is in line with what you guys want to achieve on, on the recruitment market. Um, and I will now think open the floor for questions. Do we have a couple of questions? You have one or two questions that have come uh, through so far. So first question around, uh, will everybody uh, on the call today be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint? Uh, we're going to uh, distribute an on-demand link uh, to everybody who's on here now that so you can all kind of watch and share this kind of presentation internally uh, for your folks as well. We want you to have, you know, we want to say thank you for your support. This insight is kind of part of that process. So we'll be following up with a link that you can then uh, rewatch and kind of redistribute, uh, no problem at all. And then a second question we have in at the moment is about the ability to, I guess, kind of put a firm lens over some of the issues that we've looked at and look at kind of what this looks like for your particular firm. Uh, absolutely, you can do that. This is what we've been doing with the leading teams um, kind of project with firms over the course of the last six months. And um, uh, as Rory said, uh, anybody's interested in doing that, please just reach out and we can have a chat about what that might look like and what might be involved. And unless I think I think that's all the questions we have. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, well, look, uh, I'll take the opportunity to say thank you again, everybody. Um, I hope you've enjoyed some of the content that we've taken through today. It's been fascinating to work on it, and um, we've kind of really loved working with those of you we've managed to work with so far, and hope to work with many of you, uh, many more of you in the months and years to come. So thank you ever so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.